And today we come to another one of the great themes in the Gospel of John, uh, and that is things that are full. Uh, and it's very interesting just to go through, we picked out four uh, that are interesting just to pick out, and there's never consult them uh, in the immediate context and also the application of them to our lives. Uh, the first one is John 1 verse 14, the Lord Jesus was full of grace and truth. Uh, have a look at what that means uh, and the uh, other part of those verses uh, as we go through it. Then in John chapter 7 verse 8, uh, he says, my time is not yet fully come. And so we see that the time was not fulfilled. It wasn't uh, full up the time of the Father, uh, the hour when the Lord Jesus would go uh, to the cross. And then John chapter 15, uh, there's a joy that might be full. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And then when we come right to the end of the uh, Gospel of John, the very last chapter, uh, we have the net that was full of great fishes, 150 and 3, and for all there were so many, yet was the net not broken. Uh, and so uh, here we see those four things, uh, that were full in John's Gospel. Let's just pray. Uh, Father, give thanks for your word, and again, we ask for your help as we open the Scriptures. Uh, we do thank you for uh, these uh, four beautiful verses in John's Gospel. We pray that we are able to uh, draw out the many wonderful things there are in these verses. We thank you for the character of Christ. We thank you that the Lord Jesus was on a divine timetable. He was moving exactly in harmony with the will of God and also with the time and the plan of God. And we give thanks that you want us to experience fullness of joy. Uh, and we, Father, we give thanks that you want us to experience fullness of blessing uh, and seeing souls saved. So, Father, we just ask for your help uh, in these four things and pray and make much of the Saviour that we have and pray in our own lives you would help us to live uh, more like the Lord Jesus day by day. So, Father, help us with and the battle with sin, help us with our own simple nature, help us, Lord, with the world system, which is against uh, us and against you, and help us, Lord, to remember we have a real enemy uh, who would do anything to rob us of the joy and the uh, blessing that we can have in fellowship with you in our lives. So give thanks now, and just pray for your help as we look at the Scriptures in the Saviour's name. Amen. We first, uh, turn first of all to John. Uh, chapter 1, John chapter 1. Uh, most of us will be aware of the first 18 verses, uh, if you like, our introduction to the uh, Gospel of John. In fact, there are many of the themes uh, of the John's Gospel are in uh, John chapter 1. Uh, for example, the fact that the Lord Jesus is eternal. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. One of the themes of John's Gospel is the eternality of Christ and the fact that he is eternal. Now, for example, John eight fifty eight, Before Abraham was, I am. And of course, the Jews understood what the Savior was saying. He was saying that uh, he is God. Uh, he's the I am. He's the ever-existing one. And of course, took up stones to stone him. And, as well, and there was separate occasions, particularly in John's Gospel, where this happened. Then verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so another theme of John's Gospel is the fact that Lord Jesus is creator. He's the creator, and of course, uh, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, uh, by him all things consist. And we see this in John's Gospel. He's the one that uh, can provide the water and change the water into wine. Uh, he's the one that can raise the nobleman's son uh, from a distance. Uh, right throughout the Gospel of John, he's the one that can multiply the loaves and the fish to meet the need of the multitude. He can walk on water. He can bring sight to a man who was born blind. He can raise uh, a dead man who's been dead four days back to life. He can bring the fish, or know exactly where the fish was, so the disciples could uh, catch them in John chapter 21. And so we see that one of the themes of John is his creator. But we come down to verse 14 uh, to pick up our theme. And the word was made or became, or the word means tabernacled, uh, sorry, it was made flesh and tabernacled amongst us, or dwelt. 
and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only God of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so here's the first thing that we think of uh, in relation to full things in John's Gospel. Uh, wonderful expression, full of grace and truth. And if you like this, is an explanation of the the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Uh, what that means is that the Lord Jesus is the full manifestation of the glory of God. And in this sense, John 1 verse 14 says he's full of grace and truth. Those are two characteristics of God. God's a gracious God and he's a God of truth. Uh, and so this is what was displayed in the character of Christ. Someone has says that the Lord Jesus was grace without compromise and truth without legality. I think that's a great way to explain uh, what happened, well, what, sorry, a great way to explain the character of Christ. Uh, John chapter 8, for example, with the woman uh, who was took in adultery and they came and I said, Moses in the law said that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Uh, and of course they tried to trap the Savior, uh, yet we saw grace. They, he, took, he wrote on the ground, he did not uh, embarrass or humiliate that woman in front of uh, the people who accused her. Uh, and he wrote on the ground, they all went out from the eldest uh, to the last, uh, and there was grace without compromise. Uh, he did not want to humiliate that woman, but there was truth, uh, because he said to the woman uh, in John chapter 8, uh, had no man condemned thee, oh, sorry, where are those that thine accusers, had no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And so we see there was grace and truth. And that uh, we can run right through uh, John chapter 6, for example. There was grace uh, as he healed, the, or sorry, provided the need uh, for the multitude through the lad's lunch, the uh, barley loaves and the fish. And uh, yet there was truth when he went on to say, I am the bread of life. And he contrasted himself uh, with the manna which was sent down from heaven. Of course, the Jews would have known that from the Old Testament. But John testified here as an eyewitness, even as John the Baptist testified. Uh, and of course, he testifies to the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As Spurgeon said, Beloved, notice here that these qualities in our Lord are at the full. He is full of grace. Who could be more so? Uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, the immeasurable grace of God is treasured up. Uh, these two ideas should hold our minds and direct our lives. God is grace and truth. Not one without the other. Not the other apart from the one. In his government, there can be no lowering of the simple and severe standards of truth, and there is no departure from the purpose and passion of grace. As a quote from Morgan. And so we see the first thing that is full is the character of Christ. He was full of grace and truth. Then we come to John chapter 7. Uh, John chapter 7. Then we come to the Feast of Tabernacles. It was near to the time. Uh, we'll break in at verse 5. Now did his brethren believe on him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me I hate it, because I testify concerning it that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast, I go not yet up unto this feast. My time is not yet full come. Uh, and so the second thing that it was the full, uh, here we see the time was not yet fully come. Uh, because the Lord Jesus was completely submitted to the will of the Father, and the timing of God the Father was important, even the time that he should go up to the feast. Uh, of course, uh, the Lord Jesus went up to the feast uh, later on. And so the brothers of Christ who did not believe in him at this point, uh, they, were, they could go to the feast at any time, because uh, the point was that they wanted him to go up uh, to show himself. But it was not the Father's will to go at this particular point. Uh, and of course, whilst it was in the will of God that Jesus should go up the feast, to the feast, the tabernacles, it wasn't uh, the time and all the right motive for him to go up at this time. Uh, the brothers wanted the Lord Jesus to go up to attract attention to himself. 
uh, but he would rather go up privately as he did later on and then he was able to witness in verse 14 now about the midst of the feast jesus went into the temple the other temple that is and taught and then the jews of course marveled at what he said and this then leads uh, to a conversation uh, and we notice that uh, the time here my time is not yet fully come uh, but when we go to john chapter 17 we remember what uh, the lord jesus prayed john 17 verse 1 these words spake jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said father the hour is come glorify thy son that the hour that thy son also may glorify thee here we see the time had come the time was fully come in john chapter 17 as we think of the cross and all that the lord jesus faced uh, but at this time in john 7 uh, his time had not yet fully come and so in this case john 7 uh, it wasn't fully come that his time should go to the cross then john 15 verse 11 these things have i spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full here we see this is the result of abiding in christ <coughs> uh, obedience and joy go together here in this passage verse 9 10 and 11 uh, this is a result of abiding in jesus love uh, and obedience flowing from that abiding relationship you see, when uh, we live uh, deep, uh, intimate uh, fellowship, uh, uh, sorry, lives in fellowship with the Father and intimacy, and growing intimacy, we'll be obedient, uh, we'll ask according to His will, and we'll experience uh, deep joy. And this is the point here in verse 11. The joy of the Lord Jesus is not the pleasure of ease of life, it's not the exhilaration of being right with God. Uh, so it is the exhilaration of being right with God and consciously walking in his love and care. You remember what it says in the book of Jude. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And the way we keep ourselves in the love of God uh, is to not let sin come in and break that fellowship. And if we do sin, we are to confess it straight away. First uh, John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and so we need to confess and agree with god uh, and the bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and so we go, every believer can have this joy uh, and have it as an abiding presence interestingly someone said when jesus speaks of joy nobody ever asked him what he meant the disciples didn't question this remember the disciples asked many questions in john chapter 13 to 16, uh, they did not look at each other in perplexity. To them it seemed entirely natural that the Master should make reference to his gladness. And of course from this we gather that the joy of Christ was something they were perfectly familiar with. And that's a quote from Morrison. Uh, and so the challenge for us is our experience in this joy in our daily lives, the joy of fellowship with Christ. And then our final reference is John chapter 21 and verse 11. And most of us know at this point, Peter decides to go fishing. And then the others, Simon Peter being the leader, uh, seem to follow. And of course, uh, just went off the back of their own steam, to use an expression. Uh, and uh, they caught nothing. It reminds me actually of John 15, uh, verse 5. Without me, uh, ye can do nothing. And I think this is illustrated in this story but then the morning came and jesus stood on the shore and lord jesus asked him a question children have you any meat have you any food anything to eat and they answered no and now this is very interesting because uh, on the shore earlier on uh, or later on in the passage we read that jesus uh, came and took bread and gives them and uh, likewise fish and the lord jesus had uh, breakfast already made but they asked the lord they asked the disciples if they caught anything and of course they say no and the lord jesus says cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find they cast the net and they were not able to draw it for the multitude of the fishes and verse 9 as soon as they were there they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid and bread so already at the uh, shore the breakfast was on jesus said unto him bring off the fish which he had now caught 
Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net uh, broken. Uh, and so we see, uh, this is the last of our fullness here, we see a net uh, brought the land full of great fishes. Of course, Simon Peter must be very, very strong. Uh, 153 plus a wet net will probably weigh as much as 300 pounds or more. Uh, the observation of the exact number of fish and the fact that the net did not break reflects both an eyewitness account uh, and the fisherman's perspective. Uh, fishermen always count uh, how many fish. Peter took the initiative and dragged the heavy net all by himself. Uh, the net was not broken, and of course, as recorded, there's 153 fish. Uh, of course, the point here is not so much the 153, uh, which uh, some have uh, done all different sorts of things to get the interpretation of it. I think it just simply means there's 153, as in the number. Uh, don't think there's any more significance than that. Uh, but it was significant that they brought a land to land full of great fishes. They had started uh, the previous night and caught nothing. And yet when they obeyed the Lord's instructions, uh, they found, uh, they brought the net a land, to land, sorry, a full, a net full of great fish. And here's the final thing that's full. Here is a net uh, that catches fish. And of course, this is very, very significant. And it's Simon Peter who's, uh, dragging the net to the land because in many ways it's uh, symbolic of what was going to happen in the life of Simon Peter after the Lord uh, publicly restored him uh, in a conversation uh, immediately after this which is recorded in John chapter 21 uh, we know when we come to the book of the Acts and it was Simon Peter who would speak on the day of Pentecost and we know that the Lord added to the church uh, 3,000 souls, and then uh, the church was added daily, uh, those that were being saved. And so the net uh, would not be broken. They would still catch uh, more people, not fish, but they would catch uh, followers, uh, those who repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ. But all of this was done in fellowship with Christ. Uh, and of course, the simple but profound lesson for our own lives is that uh, when we attempt to do things on our own, uh, we're often unfruitful. But uh, when we obey the Lord's instructions and follow him in our direction, we're able to catch fish, uh, not physical fish, but we're able to uh, reach people with the gospel and to see the gospel transform, save and transform lives. And so four things uh, that were full or the theme of full in John's gospel, John uh, one, the Lord Jesus was full of grace and truth. John 7, the time was not yet fully come. John 15, uh, Lord Jesus wants to experience uh, fullness of joy. And then John 21, he wants us to uh, have our nets, our spiritual nets, uh, full of great fish. And he wants us to reach out to others uh, with the gospel. Let's just pray. Father, give thanks for your word and for the challenge of it. Thank you, Lord Jesus was full of grace and truth. We pray that in our lives, uh, these characteristics would be in the right balance. We give thanks that Lord Jesus moved always in the will of God. We pray that you'd help us to move in the will of God and also in the timing of God as well. We give thanks that you want to experience deep uh, intimate fellowship with us in our daily lives. And pray Lord, we're able to do this, to obey your word and to remain in your love. And we give thanks that you want us to live fruitful lives uh, reaching out to others uh, with the gospel and seeing them saved and transformed. So, Father, we pray and help us to be obedient to all that we have uh, learned, even from these verses in John's gospel. Help us, Lord, to grow in our spiritual relationship uh, with you. Help us to mature. Help us to be transformed by your word. Help us to be more like Christ, we pray. And, Father, we give you all the glory and thank you for your help. Uh, in the Saviour's name, amen.